Good evening. My name is Susanna Antistel, and I'd like to welcome you here to hear uh, David Barsamian on targeting Iran. Um, David is a brilliant interviewer, and I saw him in action this afternoon at, uh, with Juan Cole at the University of Michigan. And that interview went so, so smoothly and so enchantingly that uh, it, I thought it was scripted for a minute before I knew that it wasn't. And this is the way he, he conducts interviews. He is the foremost interviewer of Noam Chomsky and of many, many others who, uh, such as uh, Howard Zinn, um, Vandana Shiva, uh, Arundhati Roy, uh, Tariq Ali, who don't, names that don't get on to uh, uh, the mainstream media. And uh, he is the founder and director of Alternative Radio out of Boulder, Colorado, um, a nonprofit organization that he makes tapes of his interviews and of presentations of people who, who are on uh, the left activists and um, sends these tapes out to free to uh, radio uh, stations all across the country, community and, and public radio stations. Uh, we can't get him here in southeastern Michigan, and so if you have any influence with WUOM or WDET, please bring it to bear, and I think you'll want to do that after you hear him speak tonight. Uh, he's the uh, uh, recipient of a number of awards, including the Lennon uh, Foundation Fellowship, and uh, his latest books are... Um, Targeting Iran. Our, well, wait a minute. I know that one. <laughs> what we say goes. What we say goes. Thank you very much. And targeting Iran. And I do. Um, I urge you, to, when you get a chance, to read this, to pick it up and read it, because it it gives you very easily. It's a very accessible book. Um, the of the uh, social and political faces of Iran, and what this country has in in store for it, and what that country may do in retaliation. So, David? We interrupt this program from Ann Arbor, Michigan to bring you this breaking news story from TIBC, Truth in Broadcasting Corporation. From our world corporate headquarters in a secret undisclosed underground location in Area 51 in Nevada, I'm David Barsamian of Facade News, the 24-7 newscast dedicated to keeping you in the dark. We go straight to the surface of a story and we stay there. No one can beat our in shallow reporting. We're guided by the highest principles of journalism, unfair and unbalanced. We deceive, you believe. Ladies and gentlemen, an amazing story coming across our news desk as we speak. A group in Ann Arbor calling itself the Ann Arbor Liberation Front, AALF, is reporting that George W. Bush has been arrested. The president was found burrowed deep in a spider hole on South Main Street with a stash of World Wrestling Federation DVDs and a massive collection of Kenny G and Barry Manilow CDs, all with Iranian serial numbers. He was taken into custody by this heretofore unknown group calling itself the Ann Arbor Liberation Front. A spokesperson for the group, a Mr. Sean Jacobs, uh, said, this action is long overdue. We are dedicated to nonviolence and did not use force on Bush, but we had to act. We could no longer wait for timid Democrats to enforce the law, he said, as his voice rose with indignation. It is time, he said, for Bush to face justice. Bush was later reportedly uh, shouting at his captors, do you know who I am? I am the leader of the free world. I am the decider. I am the commander guy. I am doing God's work on this earth. And God told me to strike Afghanistan, and I did. And God told me to strike Iraq, and I did. And God is telling me to strike Iran, and I will. And then, inexplicably to everyone's amazement, he burst into tears and said, I want my dad. <laughs> 
Bush faces multiple life sentences if convicted for, among other things, violating the US Constitution, the War Powers Act, the Geneva Conventions, almost all of them, and the UN Charter. If convicted, he will serve his sentence at Guantanamo. You'll recall the infamous US prison that was returned to Cuban sovereignty late in 2007. He'll have plenty of company already serving time or such luminaries as Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Alberto Gonzalez, Karl Rove, Douglas Fife, and Elliot Abrams. It looks like curtains for Bush. His head was bowed as he was led away by blue-helmeted peacekeepers from the Ann Arbor Liberation Front. ALF, as they call themselves. ALF. Bush was heard whimpering as he was taken away. Dick, Dick, Dick. Where are you, Dick? Presumably, he meant Dick Cheney. Stay tuned to Facade News on the Truth and Broadcasting Corporation Network for updates on this breaking news story. Remember, we deceive, you believe, and if you don't watch our news, you're with the terrorists. And now back to the Pittsfield branch of the Ann Arbor Public Library for your regularly scheduled program. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. Are you all Armenian? You don't look it. I mean, I can spot a couple of people. I know this is a hotbed of, uh, of uh, Armenian uh, population and activity, but it's great to, to, to be here. You know, I have never been in Ann Arbor, uh, and this is part of my Damascus, Beirut, Cairo, Istanbul, uh, New Delhi speaking tour. And now I can add Ann Arbor. I haven't missed the beat. I am right up there. You're right up there with the world capitals. But I have been speaking uh, all over the world. And as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, sadly, my broadcast, this weekly one hour that I do, alternative radio, and there's still some few catalogs left if you'd like to pick one up, uh, in the early, late 80s and early 90s was broadcast here on uh, WUOM, and maybe for some of you who are old enough to remember or were listening in those days, the station uh, went under a, a significant upheaval, uh, let me describe it as such, and uh, basically went to an all NPR format and eliminated independent producers like me from uh, having any uh, airtime, even though the program, which is produced in Boulder, where I live, is offered free of charge to all stations, unlike NPR program, which costs an arm and a leg, but which they're apparently uh, quite willing to pay. I suspect it might have something to do with the content of the programming that I present, the voices like Michael Parenti and Angela Davis and Tariq Ali and Ekbal Ahmed and Edward Said and Pervez Hoodboy and um, Howard Zinn and many of the other dissident voices that are basically locked out of the uh, corporate media. Not entirely. Uh, for example, if you watch the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, which is a nightly one hour program, in its 30 years of being on the air, and this is an award winning program, uh, they've had Noam Chomsky on once. So if you keep your, you know, if you keep your uh, TV on to uh, PBS, in the next 30 years, given the law of averages, there's a good chance that uh, you'll see Chomsky on again. But the, these other voices are completely uh, excluded. Uh, there's a very narrow format. It's a golden Rolodex of pundits and experts uh, that provide a range of opinion from A to B, that's about it. Uh, and in fact, I'm revising that. I think that's too generous. It's more like A to A squared these days. That's, that's the range of opinion. Just listen to the debate about uh, Iran today in not just uh, you know, NPR and uh, PBS, but on ABC and MSNBC and CBS and, and um, Fox and CNN and, and all the rest. Uh, you, you're basically getting two options from their uh, experts that are trundled out to pontificate about cultures and peoples uh, that they have absolutely zero knowledge about, 
uh, no first-hand information, basically. Uh, most of them are retired lieutenant colonels or full colonels or major generals or generals, you know, and there's a joke when America goes to war, you know, the corporate media with its, you know, militar militarized uh, staff of experts goes right along uh, with them. And so the debate these days on Iran is when to attack and how to do it. And then you have a, a ferocious discussion between uh, Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so and General so-and-so who says, the general, let's say, well, his opinion will be, well, we can't attack Iran just yet because, you know, we're having all these problems in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and we should, you know, we need to get more troops in the field. We need to get our logistics all lined up. And then the other voice will be, well, the, why are we waiting? Let's get it over with. You know that, you know, they're evil. They're the personification of evil. They're part of the axis of evil. And, you know, they've insulted our country so many times. Can you forget the hostage crisis? Yeah. There's not an American of, of a certain age that when you say the word Iran, the first thing they, they'll, they'll respond, almost like a, you know, a Pavlov test, is the hostage crisis. And that kind of freezes Iran in a certain time frame and around uh, a certain uh, incident. But if, if you depend on the uh, corporate media for your information, you're going to be very badly uh, informed. Uh, basically, uh, they are, be, have been, particularly in the case of Iraq, instruments of propaganda. There's no other word to describe it. When you have uh, outright fabrications and distortions and made up stories from whole cloth, some of them copied, plagiarized off the internet, including, you know, Tony Blair's famous British document, which was used by Bush to justify the attack on Iraq. This was ripped off from some uh, PhD thesis off the internet. And they presented this as fact. I mean, just, you know, absolutely amazing. So you see a lot of the, the uh, conditions that the, the public was prepared for, that you were prepared for leading up to the attack on Iraq. Some of those exact same things are being replicated, duplicated. And for the propaganda masters, it's really, um, it's an easy task because all they have to do is take the old press releases and talking points, change the Q in Iraq to an N in Iran, and they can recycle the same stories about growing threat, huge danger, weapons of mass destruction, uh, killing American troops, very dangerous, we're in you know, great peril, and, and on and on. Uh, I wonder if, if you, if we, if the American people will fall for this hook, line, and sinker again. I certainly hope not, but the prospects for an attack on Iran are increasing with each passing day. And that's one reason I wrote this book, Targeting Iran, which is based uh, partly on a trip that I took to the country um, earlier this year. I have been studying Iran for many years. I speak a smattering of Farsi, the national language of Iran, which allows me to you know, ask taxi drivers in Tehran, you know, do you like Ahmadinejad or not? Incidentally, all the answers were negative. He is uh, intensely uh, unpopular uh, inside of Iran. And when he came to New York on September 24th, you know, our great intellectual newspapers such as the New York Post had a he headline, uh, the, the evil has landed. Uh, the other great New York newspaper, the Daily News, said uh, the madman is here. Interesting uh, descriptions of um, someone who was actually elected uh, in uh, December of, uh, sorry, in June of 2005. But the media here completely missed the story. Uh, in Iran, in the political structure of Iran, as discussed in the book Targeting Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad is not the final word. He is the second in the terms of the power structure of the country. There is the supreme leader of Iran who has final word on all important domestic and international um, issues. You may be wondering about uh, this uh, tunic I'm wearing. Uh, it's called a kurta. It's kind of the national dress. You'll find it in Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, India, and, and Pakistan. 
Uh, three Fridays ago at San Francisco International Airport, I was taken over and uh, questioned by the uh, so-called TSA, the Transportation Insecurity uh, Administration. That's what they're doing, spreading insecurity. And uh, I'm certain I was uh, profiled uh, because of my dress. I think this is now uh, what I was wearing. This is now a new development in terms of targeting uh, citizens. So you don't have to, your name doesn't have to be Ali or Mohammed or Hussein or Mustafa. If you're wearing clothes, even that's associated with them. Although here you see the cultural illiteracy; they didn't realize that this is a South Asian uh, tunic, not a West Asian one. Never mind. Uh, you'll be pulled over. And uh, you know, I was questioned. You know, where you're going? Why you're going? Where you're coming from? And the, you know, they went through my uh, luggage as well. Uh, this is the kind of you know atmosphere now in the country in terms of uh, engendering uh, fear. There's been a huge increase in government uh, surveillance power, uh, wireless, warrantless, uh, wiretapping, and uh, even to the point of knowing what books you're checking out of libraries, your financial records. All of these things uh, is you know part of now the uh, landscape of uh, fear that. Is, I mention this because when you are in a state of fear, you, your brain cells lock up. And it's difficult to rationally uh, analyze and criticize and deconstruct arguments that you may hear that Iran is about to you know, attack uh, Ann Arbor or you know, the Iranian Navy is in Lake Michigan. I guess it is in Lake Michigan. When I flew over, I saw you know, all the whole Iranian fleet, aircraft carriers, submarines, cruisers. It was pretty intimidating. Uh, of course, I live in Boulder, which is inland. So every day, we see Iranian helicopters flying right above our rooftops. It's very disturbing, you know, because I'm in radio and you know, trying to do programs, and you're hearing <laughs> all this noise. It's uh, very unsettling. So uh, you know, I, I see some of you chuckling. Because uh, I think you should chuckle. I think this, uh, this so-called threat from Iran is way over-exaggerated. There's a lot of hyperbole, uh, a lot of um, exaggeration, and straight out uh, lying. And uh, I want to uh, also um, remind you that Shaman Drum Bookstore is here. And uh, this bookstore is really remarkable. And I say that not because they're here. You just have to travel around the United States to communities much larger than Ann Arbor that do not have a comparable, comparable bookstore like Sham and Drum. You know, and, and while you know, you've heard a lot about the corporate concentration in the media and, and you know, five corporations control basically what Americans see, hear, and read, uh, there's also been this huge borderization attack on independent bookstores, a proliferation of these box stores tar of uh, Barnes and Noble and uh, Borders, and it's made it very difficult for independent bookstores to compete because the large stores, like other stores, can buy in such quantity that, that they're able to offer discounts to customers. And so uh, we lose a lot when we don't have communities that have independent bookstores. Fortunately, in Boulder, there are uh, two really good independent bookstores. There's a fabulous community radio station where I got my start, uh, KGNU. And when you have really active, engaged community radio in your town, it, you can see the difference in terms of the level of information, the solidarity that people feel, the, uh, the awareness about national and international events. It's, it's quite uh, salutary uh, to have uh, such an independent uh, voice for the community. And that's where you can hear the different, you know, the whole range of opinion from A to Z, not from A to uh, A square. And that's one thing. And so I, I just want to say, please support uh, Sham and Drum Bookstore, and I'm really um, glad uh, that they're here this evening. Now, I know we're very close to the Motor City, and that reminds me of Andrew Card, a former top executive of uh, General Motors. Uh, he was Bush's uh, chief of staff during the uh, first uh, four years, 
And you might recall that he made a statement that uh, August is not a good time to bring out a new product. You know, because schools not that you know, schools still close. Most people are on vacation, they're holidaying. It's not a time you want to hit people with a new product. So as soon as Labor Day came in 2002, they hit us with a new product, and that was called Attack Iraq. And now, five years later, they have launched another product, Attack uh, Iran, basically the same tropes, the same propaganda uh, talking points. Uh, and Bush himself conducted uh, what, I, what I call electronic Nuremberg rallies. These are uh, very reminiscent of uh, the kinds of things that Leni Riefenstahl uh, documented in her, in her fabulous documentary, The Triumph of the Will. Uh, it's the 1934 Nuremberg rallies uh, in Germany, you know, with a lot of pageantry and fanfare and flags and, you know, well-dressed, manicured, you know, troops in, in uniform. And Bush set out a number of these events uh, at the American Legion, at the Veteran for Foreign Wars, at the Marine Base in Quantico, Virginia, and last but not least, in the middle of the night, since Iraq is so secure and mission is accomplished, no one even went, even kn knew he was there, uh, he went to Anbar province to talk to the troops. Uh, so the past military and present military, all surrounding the commander-in-chief, and after all, he does sign their paychecks, or his certainly their uh, leader, as it were, uh, he then uh, launched a series of attacks on Iran. This was the new product uh, that was being uh, shown to the American people. And I want to read you actually what he said uh, at one of these events, whenever I'm trying to find something. Uh, I can paraphrase it. He said, we have evidence that uh, Iranians are supplying the insurgents in Iraq with uh, deadly weapons uh, that are killing our troops. And I have given my commanders in the field orders uh, to uh, you know, attack the Iranians whenever this occurs, to, to resist this. Uh, basically, uh, you know, putting Iran on notice uh, that uh, they may be uh, in for uh, some kind of uh, military attack. It's interesting that they have now switched from the weapons of mass destruction argument, which was going nowhere, because Mohammed al-Baradai, the Egyptian Nobel Prize winner, who's the head of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, has determined that Iran is not processing uranium high enough uh, level of grade, grade level, for uh, enrichment for military purposes. And this is an ongoing discussion. He's there. I trust him. I don't trust Cheney or Rice or Gates or Bush. If you want to, with their record, I think you know, you're really taking a big chance. And don't forget, it was Hans Blix, who was kind of al Baradai's counterpart. In 2002, in 2003, he was the head of uh, the UN group that was investigating Saddam Hussein's so-called weapons of mass destruction. He was saying over and over again until he was hoarse, there is nothing there. We haven't found anything. There is nothing there. And no one was listening because of the clamor for war, because of the hysteria that was engendered. You remember the mushroom cloud? We were going to be, you know, we were going to be nuked. I mean, Saddam Hussein was, was about to attack and occupy uh, Ann Arbor and Bloomfield and Gross Point and Detroit and Windsor and, you know, the, the entire North America. With what? No one even asked. Uh, Iraq was basically a smash country uh, by 2003 when the Americans launched uh, the war. Uh, they were devastated in the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. Then the Gulf War left 200,000 Iraqi dead. And then the most punitive sanctions in history from 1990 until uh, 2003 uh, killed at least a half a million Iraqis, perhaps a million, uh, devastated the country. And uh, this was supposed to be a threat to the United States. Uh, I think we have to be very skeptical, not cynical, but very skeptical when leaders say, you know, I have the proof. Remember, some of you remember Joe McCarthy? 
in the 1950s running around all over this country saying, I have here a list of 256 communists in the State Department. Of course, there was no such list. There were very few communists, or they may have been communists in the past. He kept changing the numbers. You know, it was 187 here. Then he would say it was 314. Then he would say, no, no, it's actually 140, and, and on and on. You'll remember Colin Powell uh, at the UN on February 5th, 2003. Uh, one of the most remarkable performances, uh, I believe, in the history of the world. Uh, he presented 29 different accusations about uh, Iraq. 29. Not one of them has proven to be accurate. Well, one of them, not one of them was verified to be true, which is, if you consider that, you know, just the law of averages, you know, like if you blindfold yourself and there's a dartboard there and you're just throwing, at least one or two would hit the board. But he got 29 out of 29 wrong. That's zero, zero, zero if you're playing baseball. And a lot of those things, you know, many of those uh, kinds of allegations about, you know, secret labs, underground tunnels, uh, uh, sarin and anthrax and you know all of these things were at the time known to have been false but the corporate media the next day and you can go back and check this greeted Powell's speech uh, with words such as magnificent magisterial one of the greatest presentations any American diplomat has given in history if you had any doubts about Iraq and Saddam Hussein. They were completely erased by Secretary of State Powell's uh, presentation. Well, we now know, as I said, complete falsification, fabrication, uh, distorting, and, and I do believe lying. And now we find the same kinds of things, the exact same things going on with Iran. Articles, Cheney pushes Bush to act on Iran. Serial Killers of Americans, a front page story in the Washington Times. Bush doesn't want detente. He wants to attack uh, Iran. U.S. ties Iran to deadly Iraq attack. This is really interesting. This was a front page story in the New York Times written by Michael Gordon, who is Judith Miller's uh, co-conspirator in many of those fabrications about Iraq. It's amazing this guy still has a job and is working uh, for the Times. And it's the same kind of thing of high-ranking U.S. officials. Military commanders in Ira Ira Iraq tell me that Iranians are involved. You know, allegations, innuendo, innuendo insinuations, but no proof is ever presented. Nevertheless, these charges are then on the front page. They become the talking points on Morning Edition and All Things Considered and Rush Limbaugh and, you know, Michael Savage and Michael Reagan and Sean Hannity and, you know, Larry King. I'm, am I going up the food chain here or down the food chain? You know, the, the really the intellectual bright lights that, you know, uh, make our media uh, what it is uh, today. And not only is the U.S. blaming the disaster in Iraq on uh, Iran. They're also blaming the situation in uh, Afghanistan on uh, Iran. There's now, they say, Gates says, substantial quantities of Iranian weapons are finding their way into Afghanistan. Okay? Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that um, Bush and the people around him are accusing Iran of supporting Al-Qaeda in, in uh, Iraq and Al-Qaeda, that is the Taliban, in uh, Afghanistan. Now, if any of you know anything about uh, Islam, uh, particularly Salafi Islam, which is the type of Islam practiced by Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, this is the most uh, puritanical, um, intolerant, uh, I will say misogynist, homophobic uh, strand of Islam. Islam is a huge religion. There are one point two billion adherents around the world, ranging from Indonesia to Morocco. There are many different kinds of Islams, as there are many different kinds of uh, Christianities. So there's not one Islam. But the Islam practiced by Al-Qaeda and the Taliban is extremely intolerant of Shias, okay? To the extent that they regard Shia Muslims as heretics. 
worthy of being exterminated, killed. Uh, they do not recognize Shia Muslims as Muslims. And this is important to know because 90% of the population of Iran is Shia, and 65% of the population of Iraq is Shia. There are large Shia uh, minorities in Afghanistan, and uh, if you read uh, Kite Runner and A Thousand Sons by Khalid Husseini, you would know that. And there are uh, Shia minorities in India and uh, Pakistan as well. So it's implausible that Iran would be aiding groups that are dedicated to exterminating Iran in destroying Shia Islam. These, the Salafi types that are represented by Al-Qaeda uh, do not recognize the Imam, the Imamate line of uh, Shia Islam. This begins with uh, Imam Ali. Uh, who was the first imam, the son, son-in-law and first cousin uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, the father of uh, Imam Hussein. These are very important iconographic figures in the cosmology of uh, Shia Islam. They're both buried in Iraq, by the way, which is one reason that hundreds of thousands of Iranians go to uh, Iraq and are found uh, in Iraq because these are their major pilgrimage sites, much more important for Shias than, say, Mecca or Medina for uh, Sunnis. So to have this kind of background, if you have it, then you're able to deconstruct the propaganda, saying this, this doesn't add up. Why would Iran be supporting groups dedicated to its annihilation? I mean, they're not suicidal. So I think that is totally off the wall. And the, the Corporate media have been you know, really doing their job in terms of whipping up fear. Uh, you have here a Newsweek cover story with uh, Ahmadinejad entitled, How Dangerous is Iran? And then if you open up, you find out, very dangerous. You should be afraid. Uh, the next nuclear threat, radical Islam uh, in power. Imagine if there were an Iranian or Iraqi or Syrian or Afghan magazine with the title, How Dangerous is the United States? What might be the response here? Well, people say that's propaganda. You know, you can't believe anything published there. But when it's in a highbrow weekly like Newsweek, then you have to take it seriously. Uh, let's go to another highbrow weekly, uh, Time. Uh, here we have uh, what war with Iran would look like an actual detailed account of the targets selected by the Pentagon uh, for destruction uh, in the uh, advent of a war uh, with Iran. Again, imagine if an Iranian magazine came out, said, what with war with Iran, uh, what war with the United States would look, out, look like, uh, it would not be taken very favorably here. Then you have another Ahmadinejad. He's like a poster boy. You know, he's really easy to attack, uh, and here he is, unstoppable. This is in The Economist now. Now we're going to really sophisticated media. Uh, they write in complete sentences. Uh, they still know how to use adverbs. They know what adverbs are and use them you know, well. It's a very literate magazine. It's well edited. I read it. I read The New York Times as well. I listen to National Public Radio, and, and you know, I watch uh, the news hour with the, the, or the snooze hours as I some, sometimes call it, with Jim Lehrer, you know, arguably one of the most boring interviewers anywhere in public or even commercial broadcasting. And here we are, Ahmadinejad, again, pointing right at you, unstoppable uh, Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions. Well, I'm glad to know they're you know, unstoppable, unlike Pakistan's ambitions, or India's ambitions, or Israel's ambitions. They're not unstoppable. They have nuclear weapons. They are not signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which Iran is, incidentally. And under Article 4 of that treaty, has the right to enrich uranium for peaceful purposes. This is all discussed uh, in targeting uh, Iran. But since we live in the USA, the United States of Amnesia, and since hundreds of millions, if not the entire population, is afflicted with Alzheimer's disease, there's no memory. Uh, the media do not inform. The educational system largely does not educate. And we have you know, a population that's basically uh, very vulnerable to manipulation and control and propaganda. 
particularly when the propaganda is repeated over and over again, as Hitler and Goebbels proved in the 1930s. Goebbels said once, with constant repetition, I can convince people that a circle is a square and a square is a circle. These are mere words, and words can be manipulated. So just repeating over and over again, you'll, you'll all remember, everyone in this room remembers the buildup to the Iraq war. Iraq is dangerous. Iraq is a threat. Iraq is a growing threat. We must do something. We're in great peril, et cetera, et cetera. And you're hearing it again, the exact same tropes uh, repeated. You'll also notice uh, something else in these uh, photographs of Ahmadinejad. Uh, uh, he's, he is snarling. He is sneering. Uh, I guess he must be a very unhappy man. You know, he doesn't have a family or you know, he doesn't like poetry. Pa apparently, there are no pictures of him smiling or you know, in being in, like a, looking like a normal person. He's always frowning and looking very menacingly at you. I think this would be a very good project. I've been kind of monitoring this since the 1970s. The representation of Middle Easterners, not just Arabs, don't forget. Iranians are not Arabs the first thing they will tell you. They are not Arabs. They are Middle Easterners. Uh, and you'll find a pattern of cover stories, particularly in Time and, and Newsweek, of bearded, menacing-looking men, some of them with turbans, many of them with AK-47s, looking very fiercely at you. Uh, it starts with uh, Arafat and the PLO and uh, Ab Abu Jihad of the PLO, Gaddafi. Uh, all of these, you know, Arab leaders, Saddam Hussein, and non-Arab leaders, people like uh, Ahmadinejad. And I think there's something very racist about this uh, in terms of the characterization of uh, people in the Middle East and particularly in the world of Islam. You know, that they, the only thing going on there are angry men, you know, shouting death to America. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't go on, but that's not the only thing that goes on. These are complex societies. You know, if someone in the Arab world or in, you know, India or Pakistan said, you know, all Americans, all they do is eat fast food and watch, you know, uh, Seinfeld and Law and Order reruns, would you feel that's an accurate representation of the United States? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, maybe for a sliver of the population, but I think, you know, it's very fair to say, that would be a stereotype. So, you know, stereotypes, you know, they have this kernel of, you know, accuracy in them, but basically uh, it's a falsification of uh, reality. They take that one, uh, you know, ingredient and then magnify it and then extend it to the entire group. All Americans are like this. All Americans have guns. All Americans are violent. All Americans are oversexed. All Americans are, you know, overeat. All Americans are, are obese, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it would be interesting. Maybe there's some, you know, young students here. If you're looking for somebody to do in, in graduate school, go back and just chronicle these cover stories in major magazines. Um, I think you'll come to some very interesting conclusions. I'd certainly like to read your work. Uh, here's another uh, economist. You know, next stop, Iran. You know, like, next stop. Albuquerque, next stop, Dallas, next stop, Mobile, next stop, Tallahassee, like a rock tour. You know, that's where they're going. There's the B-2 bomber, by the way. Two of these bombers equal the entire military budget that Iran has for one year. That's why you should be afraid of Iran. Iran spends $5 billion on the military. Do you know how much, the United, you know how much our country or their country, it's hard to know what pronoun to use, you know how much our country spends on the military that we know of? Uh, it's close to three quarters of a trillion dollars that we know of. Plus, there are all these black budgets that we have no accounting for. You know, there are 16, I hate to use a term like intelligence agencies, but that's what they're called, 16 intelligence agencies. And we don't know where the money's going, where there's, a, there's no accounting for this money. Uh, who knows what's going on? You know, like the $9 billion miss missing in Iraq and the 200,000 weapons that recently went uh, missing? Nobody knows. There's no investigation. There's no oversight. And, you know, as, and, as Kurt Vonnegut, the great Kurt Vonnegut says over and over again in Slaughterhouse 5, and so it goes. And so it goes. 
And of course, they not only hate us, they hate each other. You know, another time, uh, that's the other, uh, actually, a sine qua non of these uh, uh, cover stories, the kafia, the checkered uh, Arab, as well as um, Iranian uh, scarf, as it were. And so here you'll find out why Sunnis and Shias uh, hate each other. Uh, then you had, uh, you know, now we're again getting really intellectual here, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Islam and the Bomb. Okay, this came out uh, exactly a year ago, actually, October 29th, 2006. Uh, this is a, a topic worthy, I believe, of investigation. But, you know, I've been looking since this story came out for cover stories on Christianity and the bomb, or Judaism and the bomb, or Hinduism and the bomb. And, you know, I haven't found a single cover story. I wonder why. And I wonder how long I think I'll be waiting to see a cover story uh, with that kind of title. I think it's going to be a very long time. Now, the, the prospects for uh, a US military uh, attack on Iran, uh, I believe, have increased dramatically, uh, particularly since uh, Labor Day, as uh, Andrew Card you know, told us, August is not a good time. Since Labor Day, there's been a plethora, a slew of articles, interviews given by Condoleezza Rice and, and Secretary of War, not Defense, War, Gates, and other high uh, administration officials, including Bush himself, all pointing toward Iran. Iran is why things are messed up in Iraq. Iran is why things are messed up in Afghanistan. Otherwise, it would just be peachy keen, as you know, because the Iraqis are very happy to be occupied. They're very happy to be uh, oppressed by people who don't speak Arabic, who don't care to know anything about their culture, their history, their background, uh, their civilization, uh, who are, have, have their homes broken into in the middle of the night and with American boots. And incidentally, if you know anything about Islamic culture, the shoe, the bottom of the shoe, is the lowest and filthiest uh, part of the body that you could possibly uh, you know, insult someone with. And to put your shoe on a Muslim's head is uh, an insult of just enormous proportions. The head is regarded as the highest point uh, in terms of, of uh, respect. And the, sh and the foot and the shoe is the lowest. And this is what they routinely do, screaming at them, humiliating the men in front of the women uh, and the children, terrorizing uh, the children. Uh, there have, of course, now been uh, reports just coming out, just coming out uh, of Blackwater, Blackwater uh, mercenaries massacring troops. We've been talking about this for four and a half years, and no one has been listening. That there are private contractors inside Iraq. I have interviewed Iraqi refugees in Syria, in Egypt, in Lebanon, and in Turkey who told me they're eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts, not only to these private contractors, mercenaries, but US troops just blowing Iraqis away at checkpoints, just opening up because they feel like opening up, because they are God. They are kings of the world. They are 19 and 20 year olds with, with you know, high velocity, lethality uh, you know, weapons. And they just start shooting because they're, they're scared, they're trigger happy, they don't speak Arabic, they have no knowledge of the culture or any of the traditions. They're screaming at these cars that are coming to the checkpoints in American English. What? I mean, you would even have a hard time understanding that. You know, and you're native speakers of English, most of you. So that kind of thing has been going on because colonial wars are racist. This is a colonial occupation of Iraq that is the only way to describe it. We're there because of the oil and because the United States wants permanent military bases. And if you think they're leaving Iraq, just look at the size of the embassy that they're building in Baghdad. A country of 25 million people now is going to have the largest embassy in the world, bigger than China with 1.2 billion people, bigger than India with 1.4 billion. I mean, what does that tell you? They're building a base as we speak right now on the Iranian border. There are also other bases all over Iraq. What is the resource that Iraq has that attracts American military and corporate power? 
uh, I'm going to give you an exclusive here tonight. You're the first to hear this based on my extensive research. It's watermelons. Uh, Iraqi watermelons are extraordinary. I mean, I see some of you may, may have been to Iraq. You know they taste like watermelons in no other country. The sweetness, the crispness, it's something really to savor. So clearly that's the, the motivation. And of course we want to spread liberty and freedom and democracy. We want to, and we want to liberate women from oppression because again, as you all know, the Marine Corps and the US Air Force are instruments of feminist liberation. That's why they were set up and that's why they exist. So I, again, I see some of you chuckling. Uh, you might think uh, maybe oil is involved. Gee, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Uh, that'll take a little more uh, research. Maybe it is control of oil that drives uh, US foreign policy uh, in the Middle East. And uh, maybe it's not such a concern about liberty, freedom, or uh, democracy. Now, if the US attacks Iran, uh, Iran is not a banana republic. Iran is not Grenada that can just be whisked away by the Marines landing as they did next year will be the 25th anniversary of one of the great triumphs of the American military. You know, the conquest of Grenada in 1983. Uh, a speck in the Caribbean that you can barely find of which the corporate media constantly wrote as Grenada confusing it with the Granada in Spain. I mean, they couldn't even get the spelling of it right. And you might remember that Reagan at the time declared Grenada a grave threat to the national security of the United States. I mean, you'd have to go to a Saturday Night Live script to find material like this. I mean, people should have been laughing. They should have been, you know, their ribs should have been splitting open. The, the press corpse you know, when they heard this, the stenographers to power, the lapdogs with laptops that are getting millions of dollars to supposedly report the news when they're in these press conferences with Reagan or Bush or Clinton or Carter, they should be asking real questions like, Grenada is a threat to the United States? In, in what way? Can you please document how, it is, how is it a threat? And Reagan, after the conquest of this little speck in the Caribbean, no disrespect to Grenadians, uh, said America, the days of America's weakness are now over. Americans are standing tall again. Now, I wasn't aware that Americans were stooped or that, you know, our days of weakness were so uh, apparently uh, evident. But uh, Cheney, who was a congressperson from uh, Wyoming, said, this will show the rest of the world we're back and we, me we mean business. And then, of course, you had the conquest of Panama, uh, you know, destabilization of other countries, the attempted coup d'etat in Venezuela, uh, and, and on and on. But uh, Iran is not Grenada. Iran is not Nicaragua or El Salvador that can you know, be simply destabilized by some kind of uh, counter-revolutionary uh, mercenary army. Uh, it has assets. It's a country of 70 million people. Uh, it has, as I mentioned, many co-religionists uh, in Iraq. Uh, the civilizational ties between Iran and Iraq are very, very strong. I mentioned just the religious ties and the fact that uh, Iraq is home to the two most important pilgrimage sites in all of uh, Shia uh, Islam. But there are other very, very deep connections. Most of the rulers in Iraq today owe their allegiance to Tehran, not to Washington. The Dawa party, for example, that's the party that the former Prime Minister Jafari and the current Prime Minister uh, Nuri al-Maliki, Nuri al-Maliki, uh, they actually birthed that party in Iran. They were in, in Iran, they had fled to Iran because they were being persecuted under Saddam Hussein. The same is true of uh, Abdulaziz Hakim who's the head of the other large Shia political party in uh, Iraq. He owes his allegiance to Iran. This is the, uh, Islamic, uh, the Islamic Council for Revolution in Iraq, which I think made the Americans very uncomfortable. And they changed the name recently. And it's now called the Islamic Council for Islam in Iraq. So it's become a little softer, a little more palatable uh, to Washington because they don't like to hear the words Islamic and revolutionary in the same sentence. 
Uh, and so they are very closely tied to Tehran. It would not take much for Iran to um, really um, cause damage to the U.S. in uh, I Iraq, as well as Afghanistan. Uh, many of the um, warlords in Afghanistan owe their allegiance uh, and, and are loyal to uh, Tehran as well. And you have the Strait of Hormuz right off the coast of Iran. It's about uh, 30 miles wide. It is a, a notorious choke point. Uh, it's where most of the world's oil tankers pass through. And it would not take much for Iran to block the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, if that happens, even if, if they can't block the Strait, if war with Iran happens, the $80 a barrel of that oil costs today will go to $180. The $3 a, a gallon of gasoline that you're complaining about now, you'll look back at $3 a gallon and say, wow, those were the days. Remember how cheap gas was? Because it will triple. It will quadruple. So this will, this will set off a series, I believe, of consequences. The, Pandor the Pandora's box will fly wide open, and it will have very, very grave consequences, of course, for the Iranians, who are expecting to be bombed, every Iranian uh, I met when I was there, the question was, when? When are the Americans coming? You know, And the rivers of blood that are flowing now in Iraq, and that's what it is, rivers of blood, over a million Iraqis killed, several million wounded, five million driven into either internal or external uh, exile, the biggest refugee crisis in the world, dwarfing Darfur. Darfur looks like a Boy Scout jamboree picnic compared to what is going on uh, in Iraq. Nevertheless, you see full page ads in the New York Times, you know, stop, stop the you know, horror in Darfur, help them, etc. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. But compared to what's going on in Iraq, it doesn't even measure in terms of scale. So the rivers of blood that are flowing now in Iraq will turn into oceans of blood. And the, again, the consequences, once this genie is out of the bottle, if they do launch a war uh, on Iran, I think the, the outcomes are very difficult to predict. But with certainty, I can say they will be catastrophic. And I want to close. That's an applause line, folks. <laughs> Some places I get standing ovations when I say finally and I want to close. I want to close with the words of a, a wonderful Iranian woman who I got to know a little bit. Her name is Shireen Ebadi. She won the 2003 Nobel Prize. She's a lawyer, a human rights activist, a judge. Uh, she lost her job under the Islamic regime, which is uh, quite patriarchal. Uh, does not, does not, I would say, does not allow women to speak out clearly against the state. Uh, women are very visible in Iran. 65% of all college and university students are women. They're very visible in the media. When I was there, you know, watching television, every single reporter, commentator, analyst was a woman. Uh, in medicine, in education, in engineering, huge representation of women. But when it comes to political power, almost no representation in terms of uh, the government. And Shreen Ibadi is you know, regarded very highly, not just in Iran, but around the world, as someone who wants uh, a more moderate, a more compassionate regime, if you will, uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, I want to read you a couple of things that she said to me. The Iranian people are exceedingly proud of their 2,500 year history and culture. Iran as a country is larger and greater than its rulers and exists apart from any government in power at any particular time. This is a very important statement, because Iranians are very aware of who they are. I mean, we're all aware of who we are. But the sense of Iranianness is very, very strong. If any of you are Iranian or know any uh, Iranians, uh, you will know this, that they're very, very proud of their culture, their tradition, their history. I mean, they've been around for, you know, like China three, four, five thousand years. There has been a Persia since ancient times. This is not, you know, some Johnny come lately, you know, USA that's been around for 225 years. There is a long cultural tradition. Iranians know about 
Rumi and Hafiz and Sadi and Jami and Khayyam and uh, Nezami and Ferdowsi and all of their great poets right down to the current period. As I write in my book, uh, the greatest contemporary Iranian poet died a couple of years ago, Ahmed Shamlu. 100,000 people came to his funeral. 100,000 people. When Allen Ginsberg died uh, in, the, in the 90s, there were like 70, 80 people at his, at his funeral. And people thought that was, wow, that's impressive. You know, that many people came out for a poet. So I, I just want to emphasize that the, the reach of poetry and of the Persian language is very, very deep in Iran. If there's some people from South Asia here, maybe in the back, they would know that that tradition extends to Urdu uh, as well in that great cultural uh, tradition. And Iranians are quick to tell you they're not Arab, they're not Semites. They speak an Indo-European language. So actually, Farsi, the national language of Iran, is much closer to, say, Urdu or Hindi or Bengali or Pushto uh, than it is to Arabic. Even though it is written in the Arabic script from right to left, yes, they write in, in Arabic. And of course, most of the religious discourse uh, is in Arabic. But uh, the grammar is Indo-European. It's very closely linked, actually, to uh, Sanskrit as its, as its grammatical source. So there's no connection there uh, with Arabic except on, a, on, a, you know, on this level, on the level of religion and the script. And the Iranians, in fact, took the Arabic alphabet of 28 letters and added four of their owns, own to accommodate their own uh, sounds. They also have their own unique music system. It's called the Dastaga. Uh, it's like the Raga system in India. And they have their own unique instruments. So they're very aware of who they are and, and their you know, cultural and historical traditions. But this is what Ebadi says. If America attacks, however, Iranians will unite, forgetting their differences with their government, and they will fiercely and tenaciously defend their country. Later she told me, she, had, she was in uh, Denver, actually, when I, when I saw her in uh, last year. She said, democracy cannot be brought to a people with cluster bombs. Let me repeat that. Democracy cannot be brought to people with cluster bombs. Apparently, there are people in Washington and Tel Aviv who believe that democracy can be spread uh, through cluster bombs. Any military invasion or even the threat of one harms democracy. It's not something that happens overnight. Democracy needs to evolve in a peaceful atmosphere. And the US should not impose it on Iran or any other country. It will be a disaster if it tries. And this is what I heard from Iranian after Iranian saying, yes, we're not happy with our government, but we want to own our change. We want to be part of it. We don't want it imposed from outside because that will not give it the authenticity it needs uh, in terms of you know, coming up from the, from the people themselves. And I think we should you know, listen uh, to the Iranians and do whatever we can in terms of resisting an attack uh, on Iran, because not only would it again be another grounds for impeachment and even more criminality by one of the most criminalized regimes in the history of the United States. I'm talking about the people in power today. Every single one of them should be in jail for the uh, offenses, uh, including you know, the uh, violation of the UN Charter, the planning and waging of aggressive war, uh, numerous uh, violations of, of the Bill of Rights, uh, et cetera. So on that note, um, I hope, you know, you'll get copies of Targeting Iran. Shaman Drum is here. And I believe we have a little bit of time for questions and Yes, answers. we have plenty of time for questions. And if you raise your hand, because as I mentioned before, uh, we are filming for community television, and we need to hear the questions. I'm going to start right here. Um, just a quick comment to start. My name is Amy Smith, and I'm um, spokesperson for the committee to defend Catherine Wilkerson, who's a doctor who actually, Ray Tanter was in town last year calling for a regime change of Iran. 
at, at the University of Michigan and people including some Iranians were protesting that and unfortunately were attacked by the police and hauled out by force and um, a physician, Dr. Wilkerson, who tried to intervene and protect the safety of one of those people who was injured um, was subsequently, not that night, but subsequently charged with uh, criminal charges. So I have information I urge people who are concerned about protecting our ability to speak up and be safe in doing that to um, get involved and help out. Um, and I just my question would be, uh, there's a lot of talk about the Mershammer and Walt uh, article and the thesis about the Israel lobby being a key factor in getting us into the first Gulf War, the second Gulf, uh, the second reinvasion of Iraq, and also pushing for the invasion of Iran. A AIPAC has been pushing for the invasion of Iran. Hillary Clinton has been on board for quite some time. And I just wonder if you could comment on the role of AIPAC and the Israel lobby in this country, uh, getting the U.S. to do the work for regional dominance for Israel. Well, now we're getting into what Edward Said called the last taboo in American politics, the one topic that everyone skirts very gingerly for fear of being labeled as a Nazi, a Holocaust denier, and an anti-Semite or, or you know, other such loathsome uh, terms. But I think it's uh, a topic very much needed to be discussed and discussed in the open. I mean, we are supposed to be living in a free and democratic society. Why should certain topics be off limits? Uh, that, I th you know, is, I think, very, uh, it's distressing that so many people feel reluctant uh, to talk about uh, this issue. The uh, book that um, Amy was referring to uh, is uh, called The uh, Israel Lobby. It's a uh, work by uh, two professors, one from the University of Chicago, John Mersheimer, uh, the other from Harvard, uh, Stephen Walt. These are not radical people, by the way. This is not Noam Chomsky or you know, Howard Zinn or Michael Parenti. I mean, they're kind of mainstream scholars. Uh, I have the book. I haven't, uh, I haven't read it, but I read the original uh, piece that came out in the London Review of Books, so I'm very familiar with their, their thesis, which seems quite plausible. Uh, lobbies exist to influence uh, legislation. Look, there's an Armenian lobby. You know, they're working in Washington trying to influence legislation. That's what they're there for. That's what lobbies do. There's an auto lobby. There's the NRA. There are other lobbies. Why, why is it then considered uh, taboo or in some bizarre way uh, anti-Semitic to be talking about uh, the fact that there is a lobby working on behalf of, uh, you know, uh, to promote interests of the Israeli government or policies that would aid and, and uh, support uh, Israel. So that's, you know, as they, as they used to say in the 60s, as, an, as, as American as apple pie. I think it's a very corrupt system, by the way, because it means who's got the, you know, who's got the most bucks has the most influence. Well, that speaks to our whole uh, political system, which is awash in cash, which answers to, you know, the highest dollar. And you know that's this is what it's about. This is this is what democracy looks like. Not not every you know four years turning out for this or that millionaire or member of the Skull and Bones Club at at uh, Yale. This is what democracy really looks like. And and you know they have a, a lot of influence. Uh, I'll just give you one example. I'm not quoting from Mersheimer and Walt. Uh, in the last Iraq appropriations bill war appropriations bill this past spring, there was a sentence in there that said, the Bush administration cannot take military action on Iran without congressional approval. Okay, it's pretty clear. The uh, bill passes and we're looking at it the next day. The sentence is gone. I mean, what happened to it? Uh, according to the nation and other uh, sources, I haven't looked into this myself, uh, the Congress, particularly the, the Democratic leadership, uh, Pelosi and Reid, came under pressure from APEC, and they decided to get rid of this uh, clause. Uh, so one more restraint has been removed from, uh, from an attack on Iran. Of course, Pelosi has a little bit of history here. Six months earlier, right after she became Speaker of the House, she made the enormous blunder, a colossal mistake of announcing that impeachment is off the table. 
impeachment should be on the table. If there were ever a case for unambiguous, if there were ever an unambiguous case for impeachment, I believe the current president and vice president you know, should be impeached. The, the evidence is overwhelming. There are a couple of young people in the audience here. Do you remember what Bill Clinton was impeached for? He was, I mean, I was really serious, right? I mean, millions of people died. Billions of dollars were spent. Countries were invaded. I mean, it was an awful thing. You remember that? He was, in fact, impeached by the House. And then the Senate, which is the jury, decided not to convict. But that's what happened in uh, 1998. Uh, that particular offense or crime, nothing to be celebrated, incidentally, uh, men exploiting women who are much younger than they, men in power, there's a long history of that in many cultures, you're not, you're not unique here. That just pales in comparison to the wars on Afghanistan and Iraq and you know, perhaps a future war uh, on uh, Iran. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a topic that needs to be fleshed out and flushed out and talked about in a serious way. Now, at the same time, there is a horrible thing called anti-Semitism. There are some people who simply hate Jews. This is unacceptable. It's inexcusable. There's no rationale for it. It must be, whenever it appears, and it occasionally does, it must be denounced. It must be exposed. Uh, incidentally, Arabs happen to be Semites. But Jews have appropriated this term uh, anthropologically to apply only to themselves. So you could make a case that when, when you, know, you have uh, Glenn Beck on CNN or Rush Limbaugh on the radio denouncing Islamo-fascists and Arabs are racist and they're Hitler and they're this and they're Nazis, uh, you could say, well, that's a form of anti-Semitism. But uh, clearly, it won't be understood uh, in this uh, particular uh, social political uh, context. Uh, it's very, so it's important that we recognize uh, the reality of anti-Semitism. It can have very bad consequences, as can anti-Arab, anti-Iranian racism can have very, very bad uh, consequences. So I think we should be vigilant. Uh, we should be very um, principled about our objection to racist characterizations of any group because the outcomes are extremely deleterious. Okay, and there's much, much more work to be done in this area. Okay, my name is uh, Sean Jacobs. I'm not a member of any, um, I think that was just a parody at the beginning. But my you question mean there is, is not an, uh, is an, not an Arbor Liberation, Arbor Liberation Front? Front? I was told I that such a group existed. I know why you used my name in that. <laughs> anyway, my question is, um, the, the way you describe the current administration's relationship or their, you know, the way they talk about Iran, it's kind of very adversarial. But the United States has a more complicated history with, with Iran. Maybe you can say something about that just to, just to complicate it a little more. Well, of course, the, as, and this is talked about in the book in great detail, uh, the United States crushed democracy in Iran by overthrowing the democratically elected and popular government of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. This is something that every Iranian knows and talks about. You know, I said, you know, Americans of a certain age, all they know about Iran is the hostage crisis. Well, I would say any Iranian of any age will know about and can talk about what happened uh, in 1953 when the CIA intervened. Uh, and overthrew uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, who, by the way, was no radical. He was a very moderate, uh, middle-of-the-road guy. He had great admiration for the United States. There's a famous photograph of him in Philadelphia looking up at the Liberty Bell with awe in his eyes. I mean, he's like a little kid looking at Britney Spears or something, uh, just with tremendous veneration and, and, and admiration. So, uh, of course, uh, Mossadegh didn't understand the basic rules of, uh, of global statecraft uh, as, as uh, defined by the United States. What is yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. And so Iranian oil doesn't belong to Iran. It belongs to us. It just happens to be in Iran. See, he was a very backward man. Uh, he was educated in France at the Sorbonne, so obviously he was handicapped didn't have a Harvard education, just had, happened to have gone to the best university uh, in France, one of the best 
uh, in the world. And he had this funny idea that, you know, Iranian resources should go to the benefit of the Iranian people. I mean, how silly can you get? Didn't he understand that all of those resources should be going to London and New York? And he nationalized oil. This sent London and, and Washington into a tizzy because here you have the threat of a good example. You know, what if he actually succeeds and Iran starts flourishing and the government delivers the kinds of things we're so, you know, used to here in the United States, like free health care from cradle to grave, free education from kindergarten right through graduate school, pu free public transportation, you know, all the things we're spoiled with here in, in the U.S. What if, he, you know, what if he succeeded in that? It would be a threat of a good example. And this is actually beyond ideology what drives U.S. foreign policy. It's not just oil. It's the fact that if anyone stands up, like Ahmadinejad, like Morales in Bolivia, like Chavez in Venezuela, like the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, like the FMLN in El Salvador, like Noriega, whatever their political stripe is, they have to be cut down to size. The godfather cannot have couples running around who are independent. They have to belong inside you know, the sphere of US uh, influence. I, I tell people, I mean, I want you to buy this book and my other book with Chomsky, What's, What We Say Goes. It just came out. There, there are a few copies left. But I tell people that if you really want to understand how US foreign policy works, watch 10 minutes of any episode of The Sopranos. That's all you need. 10 minutes of any episode, if you, and very, in a, in a second, if you, Tony Soprano is the head of this gang in Jersey, right, the mafia boss. If you honor him, if you respect him, he'll take care of you, he'll send you flowers on your birthday, he'll send you a cheesecake on your anniversary, he'll, get, he'll lend you his yacht, he'll give you his house in Miami where you can go on vacation. You will be totally taken care of. But the moment you get an idea in your head, you know what, I'm a pretty smart cookie myself, you know, maybe I should open up my own little, you know, mafia gang over here in Paramus or down here in Trenton, you know, maybe I get my own little action going. Why do I got to always belong to Tony Soprano, you know what I mean, you see what I'm saying? And so, if I go off the reservation, as it were, and open up my own operation, Tony Soprano cannot tolerate that, because then other people will get ideas, hey, look, Look at David over there in Trenton. He's got his own operation going. Maybe I'll get something going in Brooklyn. What about Long Island? And pretty soon the whole thing will unravel. The whole power structure will unravel. So it's the, the Don's obligation to control you know, the entire family, as it were. And so no one is allowed to be independent. That's why they hate Chavez. If he was singing the American line, they would love him. If Castro had been singing the American line, or Lumumba, who they assassinated uh, in the Congo, or Allende uh, in Chile, you know, or the overthrow of Juan Bosch in, in the Dominican Republic, the, the, and the liberal democracy in, in uh, Brazil in 1964, and on and on and on. Arbenz in uh, Guatemala, the very year after uh, Musadek was overthrown. This is a constant pattern in US foreign policy. And I think you know, we should recognize reality. It's important to strip away these fairy tales and myths about, you know, we're helping people all over the world. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that's not the driving force. The driving force is domination. It's hegemony. It's control of resources. Another question over here. Thank you. Um, you said that um, how many did you Amani Dejav is just the second, you know. Um, but you haven't mentioned anything at all about how many. So can you tell us more about how many uh, and where he really uh, stands? Yeah. That she, she's referring to the supreme leader whose name is Khamenei. Khamenei. Yeah. Khomeini was the first Ayatollah, the leader of the Islamic Revolution, who died in 1989. It's, it's different spelling, yeah, different spelling, Khamenei. And he is the uh, supreme leader of Iran. He decides, actually, Iranian policy. He is selected by other clerics 
86 to be exact. It's called the Assembly of Experts. This is a very Byzantine type of uh, political structure. And uh, those clerics can remove the supreme leader if they so uh, decide. And most recently, in a, in a very important election, um, Ali Akbar Haf uh, Rafsanjani, who is a previous president of Iran, who himself is an Ayatollah, yet another cleric, has become a key figure in this assembly of experts. So there is some um, speculation inside Iran that um, there may be a replacement of the current supreme leader. There's also rumors that he's not well and that you know, he, he's, in fact, uh, quite ill. It's, it's not clear. You know, in, a, in a situation where information is so closely controlled uh, by the state, it's very hard uh, to know what's going on in the inner councils. But these are the, these are the kinds of things uh, that are said. I mean, Iran is a theocratic state. Uh, it is also, paradoxically, a republic, hence the title, the Islamic Republic of Iran. There is a functioning Congress. It's called the Majlis. It's the Iranian uh, parliament. People are elected. There are, there are elections, but there are elections within very narrow frameworks. It's very difficult for uh, candidates who oppose the regime to get on the ballot. So you get you know, very narrow choices. Not too much unlike what goes on here in terms of choices. Yes. Ahmadinejad. Yes, the, the clerics are they, ruling they, the country. Orders and them. Ahmadinejad is personally ex, uh, vilified in Iran today. He's highly unpopular, particularly with young people. I talk to a lot of university students. You all remember this Holocaust conference that Ahmadinejad hosted in Tehran in December. And it was a huge catastrophe for Iran. There's not a single Iranian uh, you know, who did not feel shame or was embarrassed by this thing. I mean, this was ridiculous. The Iranian government paying David Duke uh, to, to come to, to the country and people like Robert Forusson from France to come to Tehran to you know, present their evidence about uh, the Holocaust. A huge disaster. And he was, uh, Ahmadinejad, was denounced, and, and the students, you know, there's a very high unemployment rate uh, in the country, and they were telling me, these graduate students who are about to graduate, uh, they said, you know, we don't need Holocaust conferences, we need jobs. We need jobs, we need employment, we need a future. And what is Ahmadinejad, you know, wasting not just money, but our reputation, our good name in the world. And of course, this has been a dream for Washington and Tel Aviv and the other countries that want to bring down Iran. You know, look at them, they're Holocaust deniers. So in a way, you know, Ahmadinejad is like out of central casting. I mean, he's this really, you know, bad figure. He does have some support in the country uh, among Islamists, religious fundamentalists, like Bush has support among religious fundamentalists in this country, as well as the military, because he's a former war veteran. He fought against Iraq in the 1980s. So he has that kind of base. And also, um, many of the poor in Iran identify with him because he is one of them. His father was a blacksmith. He grew up in very humble circumstances. He worked his way through school. Uh, he graduated from the university, became a professor of engineering. So there's some you know, identification there and some pride you know, in terms of class. You know, he's one of us. And he's got this you know, off-the-cuff you know, just one-liners, and you know, he has, he's a very informal style. You may have seen him, uh, the way he speaks. So he does have, you know, some support in the country, but uh, he is in a minority right now. Uh, there were municipal elections in Iran a few months ago. Every single candidate affiliated with him was defeated, was routed, rather, to say. So he is definitely, you know, uh, I believe, um, declining in terms of uh, power. And there are, you know, his, he's up for election in 2009. But the assembly of experts, this group of clerics, 86 clerics, has the power to uh, remove him. And the supreme leader in Iran can remove him at any time. 
I think that's just about all the time we have for questions because David will be signing some books right over here with Shaman Drum, but we want to thank everyone for coming. Tonight there are evaluation forms right in back here and be sure to visit Shaman Drum and thank you, David. Thank you very much. This concludes our broadcast. For a complete listing of upcoming events at the Ann Arbor District Library, visit our website at www.aadl.org or call the library at 734-327-4200. Press option 3 for events listings.